Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. <clears throat> Looks like some are still connecting. Yes. There we go. I'll wait another minute or two. Hey, Hope. Hi, Hope. Hello. Hi, Scott. Hi, Scott. Hi. Nice to see you all. We have a few people still coming in. Hello. Hey, Todd. Todd. Hi. How are you all? Very good. Very good. good. All right. All right, I think we'll get started uh, and we'll let people in as they come. Um, and it, it, Matt, do you want to take it away? Yeah, absolutely. So good morning, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Matt Chatsey. I'm a host here at uh, Systems Thinking Daily. I facilitate courses at Cornell, and I also use this work in my consulting, helping um, communities um, use nature to combat climate change. Uh, I'm excited to be hosting the first and what we hope is a, a long series of uh, research discussions with Derek and Laura. And the goal is really to make the research more accessible and figure out ways that the research can be useful to all of us in our uh, daily work, uh, both with business challenges, uh, social issues, and uh, personal challenges. So it's really a unique opportunity, I think, to a uh, powerful opportunity to explore the intricacies of the research uh, with the authors and with the world experts on these topics. So I hope we're gonna have a lot, of, a lot of fun today. Um, I'm on a call right now. Oh, if you could, Tommy, there you go. Um, so little introduction I think is needed, but for any new folks on the call, uh, Derek and Laura teach uh, systems thinking and mapping and leadership at Cornell. Uh, consult around the world with organizations um, addressing some of the most complex challenges we have, our sought after speakers, and in their spare time, uh, started and run the Cabrera Research Lab. So I think most of you probably have, but if you haven't, uh, drop in and there's just a ton of interesting both research and, and other materials on the lab for you to check out. Um, the lab and part of the discussion today brings together three elements. So public understanding, innovation in media, and applied and basic research uh, with the vision of 7 billion systems thinkers and the mission of push, facilitate, and motivate. Um, and I just, I love, uh, through teaching, I love the, the VMCL, the clarity of the, the vision and the sort of simplicity of the mission is, is great. So uh, I love to use that as a model. Uh, I also want to thank, uh, thank Elena today, Cabrera, who's been helping uh, get this up and running smoothly, and uh, so appreciate your help too, Alina. So quickly, the, today we'll have, we have about 45 minutes in total, and so uh, Derek and Laura will talk for about 20% some of the research and, and slides, and then if you have questions as we go, please feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll work them into the informal discussion uh, for the last 20 or 25 minutes or so. And just so you're aware, this session is being recorded and we will post it in Systems Thinking Daily and uh, perhaps other spots in the near future. So with that, uh, let me hand it over to Derek and Laura. Thank you all for being here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for being here. It's good to see beautiful faces across the screen. We're always happy to do these kinds of things yeah, when we can. It's exciting. So today is the first of many um, systems thinking research made simple, which is this new thing that's going on. Today, we're going to start with the fish tank experiment. The fish tank experiment. The fish tank experiment. Dun, 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 dun. And what I want to do is just give you a little bit of the overview of what it was and sort of how we did it. And then as we start to discuss it, we can probably get into the details of the things that matter to you all rather than us sort of laboriously take you through it at, at fine grain detail. Um, so it is named the fish tank experiment because we did actually use the image of a fish tank. <clears throat> we did this with um, some of our graduate students at Cornell actually helped uh, implement this research. And I just want to sort of show you how it was designed and what we did. So we basically took um, four samples of 400 respondents each. So we had a sample total of 1600. And we did basically four experiments because we wanted to test each of the four patterns of systems thinking separately. So one group of 400 did a question related to distinctions, another to systems, another relationships, and another perspectives because we wanted to really test each one individually and see if we could have an effect on them 
based on the um, the experiments. So, and that sample size is generally thought to be uh, generalizable to the um, the what it represented, which was the U.S. population. So, yes. So it was a pretty simple interface. Um, the respondents were given this image of a fish tank and they were asked simply to describe what they saw. They completed what they saw uh, on their own, filling in their own, form, you know, the fields in a form. They wrote down everything they saw. And then after they did that and they completed that first response, we gave each one of them a short treatment in one of the four patterns of thinking. For example, one sample, we're given this uh, set of, in not instructions, but this information about distinction making. And it was the basic four things, you know, that, you know, distinctions are uh, all around us. They're in how we name things. They're how we identify and differentiate things, ideas, objects, people, how we distinguish things from one another, that they, um, any object or identity is um, any object that we, we identify is an identity and an other, meaning it has its own identity. And then there's always all of the other things that it's not. Um, that we can make distinctions generally or specifically, you know, like a cup is distinguished from a glass, but then we can distinguish a red cup from a blue cup. And also that any um, single distinction can mm -hmm. become a lot of distinctions. Um, for example, birds, can be one distinction, but then further broken down into other distinctions of specificity like owls, eagles, seagulls, that kind of thing. So this is what the distinction group. And we wanted the treatments. Uh, these are the treatments. There were four of them for D, S, R, and P. And we wanted them to be relatively short. So um, I think that the longest one is R and that took 52 seconds sure. on average to read. Yeah. Uh, the shortest one was about 30 seconds. So the treatment is a, is a very short treatment under one minute, as we say, for all uh, for each one. So yeah. under four minutes total across the groups. We also were very careful to language what we were showing to the groups in <clears throat> layman's terms and in and more sort of common, common uh, language rather than the sort of technical stuff we sometimes yeah. say, which is not as interesting. This is the treatment that they had for part whole systems, basically very similar that systems are all around us, um, that it's how we group uh, objects together and nest things together, that part whole structure um, means that anything that we're thinking about can simultaneously be a part of something or a whole in and of itself, which is one of the central tenets of systems thinking. And that we wanna make sure that we are purposely looking for the part whole structure of things in systems to better understand them. And that you can zoom in and zoom out, right? That you can have part whole uh, systems across many levels of scale, you know, plus one, minus one are the kinds of things we talk about in systems. And then relationships. The yeah, the relationships was the longest one, like I said, 52 seconds to read on average. Um, and again, we just kind of went through what are relationships, what are the, uh, the, you know, the action and reaction that, you know, person A could act on person B or vice versa. Um, and then there'd be a reaction to that action, that type of thing, and use the mom and dad example. And, you know, really basic description of, of relationships as written there. And then- Well, um, and we hinted towards RDS. Yes, we did hint towards RDS parts, as well. You know, we're crazy for RDS. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, uh, and then perspectives was the same. Uh, that one took 50 seconds to read. So 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 50 seconds, 50 seconds. Um, and these are all four different groups, remember. So only uh, any individual participant only saw one of these. Um, so purposefully. Purposefully. And right. perspectives, we went into point and view and being able to take perspectives and also conceptual perspectives versus, um, uh, you know, perspectives with eyeballs kind of thing. And, um, yeah, you know, basically just a very quick treatment of D, S, R, and P. And we kind of wanted you to experientially see how simple it was, the treatment that this each group read so that the results, you know, you're getting the context of the results that this is literally all they saw. So they saw the fish tank, they wrote down everything they saw, then they read the treatment, one of these sheets, and then we asked them again to describe what they saw in the fish tank. And here are the results, right? Across the four groups uh, with high statistical significance, what we saw 
was a very large, uh, significant increase in the number of words, the complexity of words, the uniqueness of words to describe that fish tank. Now, on its face, that might not seem really very interesting or remarkable, but I think it's interesting. Well, but not everybody <laughs> thinks that because <laughs> they're not us. What's fascinating to us is, is that what you can see is with just a tiny little exposure to one of the patterns of systems thinking, instantaneously, almost without knowing it, people are seeing more in an image, right? They're thinking more complexly, which is indicated by the language they use to describe the image in the second um, iteration, which is really showing us that just knowing one of the patterns of thinking really increases the robustness of their thinking, how much they're seeing of a system in front of us, just from a minute of an, an intervention, which to me is like, that's yeah, pretty cool. cool. Right? So, so th these graphs, just so it makes sense, it, it, um, if it doesn't, these graphs are for D, S, R, and P, uh, and for those four treatments that we just talked about, and the red is the pre and the blue is the post. So you can you don't even have to be able to sort of read the graph to see the significant increase in uh, what is what's effectively called cognitive complexity. So the cognitive complexity of the answers increased, the blue increased uh, post after the treatment in relation to the red prior to the treatment. Right. And so you can imagine, you know, one of the things that we are encouraged by is with just a, a, a small intervention, people can start to experience seeing more of a system, have more sophistication in what they're thinking about, see more perspectives, be more systematic, get more meaning out of what they're thinking about. Um, and that leads us to sort of be encouraged because then if that can happen after a one minute treatment, then we ask ourselves, well, what, what about <clears throat> a much, much larger, larger treatment, treatment like know, a day or a something day like or that. reading a book or who knows doing a project anything like that and not just and, more but better in our analysis we we analyze about eight different dimensions this is showing just one of those uh and we got uh statistical significance across uh, all these different dimensions um but and what we we can talk more about what those are but not just more, so we got quantitatively more and qualitatively more, but also better, uh, like more, you know, more meaningful, more perspectives, more, um, you know, better analysis, that type of thing. So we saw essentially the results are more and better from a very simple one minute or less than one minute treatment. And just to give you a little bit of a historical a backstory, way, way, way back, it wasn't clear to people what systems thinking was, first of all, or once we figured out what it was, that people could actually be taught to be yeah. more systemic in their thinking. So for us, we're fast forwarding 15 years and we're like, holy moly, in one minute, you can actually see people can learn it and they can learn it fairly easily. So this is why we I are, think holy moly is a is a research vernacular for well uh, high statistical. To be validity. honest, I realized we're recorded, so I cleaned it up. Holy moly! Well, I wouldn't have said that, but I was in my mind editing myself because we're on tape. <laughs> that's that's the equivalent of high statistical. That's holy a good p value. Holy moly! That's going to have to get us to be more serious. Yes, exactly. We're not doing very well with that. So with that, that kind of just summarizes what what we did. And um, and then we'll we'll walk through. Matt has a uh, you know a few questions, and and maybe you have some questions. The goal of which is to, you know, like Matt said at the beginning, we really want to make research um, accessible to the general public or people that maybe don't always read research reports um, and try to try to decipher what it means do. and that type of thing. The so food is ready. Um, so we'll we you know we'll open it up for questions later on and and um, yeah. and and walk through maybe some of what this all means, but that's kind of the basics of what we did. Yes, I have a quick question, um, just about the like what was the venue that the people were the the subjects were in this test? Was it online or was it in person or kind of how did it, logistically how did it how did it happen? 
it, it was online. So they, they uh, did it, you know, in their browser. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I'd like to, to start, just kind of go up a, a level and uh, you've talked in the past about um, efficacy research versus sort of existential research and, you know, how a study like this kind of fits in between um, more academic, you know, I guess sort of basic concepts of research and, you know, things that we can kind of immediately take and use in our in our own work. So it was great if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, do you want to start on that or do you want me to? You start. Okay. Uh, so that the way that I sort of think about it is, is there's there's two parts to this type of research. One is do the things that we're talking about exist? And within that part, there's two parts, which is do they exist cognitively and do they exist in nature, right? In, in reality, right? So because obviously, you know, we can have cognitive biases that aren't existing in reality. So we want to know, like, are these things actually, you know, real in the cognitive space? And are they real in nature in terms of structures of nature. Um, and so we call that existential research, which is, is kind of a, well, it's sort of an existential word. It's a big word that just means, do they exist, right? Do, does DSRNP exist in the mind and does it exist in nature? And so that's one of our fundamental sets of questions that we ask. And um, we're gonna be uh, talking about 27 other studies we did that focused on that, on those questions, and 150 different studies that are part of a lit, lit review that focused on the existential questions of DSRP, which again, existential sounds like a big word. We're, we're literally saying, does DSRP exist in the mind? Does DSRP exist in nature? This study didn't focus on those things. It focused on what we call efficacy, which is the effect of knowing DSRP or using DSRP. So it didn't really have anything. This particular study that we're talking about today doesn't really talk about whether or not DSRP exists. That's handled by other studies. It's, it's really focused on if somebody has a metacognitive awareness of D or S or R or P, does it have an effect? And if, if so, what is that effect? Ideally, we're looking for increases in cognitive complexity, which is kind of a scientific term for systems thinking, mm -hmm. right? The ability to sort of think in complex ways to match the complexity of the real world. So we're looking for that effect. And that's what this study fundamentally was about. Well, and I think it's important also when we talk about effect and e efficacy, a lot of that is grounded in our historical work in schools, which is, you know, we before we did all of this stuff that we're talking about now, we literally were in, I don't know how many hundreds of classrooms observing the effect of young children learning these things in an age appropriate context kind of thing, like a kindergartner's learning to distinguish red from blue, right? That kind of stuff. And to see those moments where a child understands how they thought about something, how they thought it through, and then immediately pivoted and applied that skill to something else. And that kind of like light bulb that went off. I think that's really why we've come on this trajectory to, we know, we, we know, it, we know it exists, which was your doctoral research really. And we've been really in a lot of contexts looking at its effect on people. But if you think about solving the things that we're dealing with today, as, as like, I don't know, typical it is to say, if we started teaching people to be systemic in their thinking from day one, all of, all of these things would be different. It would, it would change things a lot because students are very open to, you know, younger, younger students are very open and malleable and, and in a, in a weird way, they're not, they haven't been taught out of systems thinking yet. So we could have a huge effect on that. And so I think we're we're extending that with this kind of research. Yeah, we're making it more formal. So one of the tables in in the uh, paper that you'll see is this one here, which is just a, a two by two table, which is about mind and nature, 
existential efficacy. And so that really captures in, in four, you know, really three quadrants because the, the right one is combined. Um, it captures sort of the, our whole research agenda. Yes. And talk a little bit about the kind of the state of research in general and, and like in systems thinking and, and these three or four quadrants and kind of how they, you know, is there a ton of research? Are there other folks, you know, other than the, your lab that's that's coming out with this? Um, you know, where does it all sort of fit fit uh, fit in? How does this fit into the, the bigger body of research, I guess? Hmm. Yeah, I, I wish I could say that, you know, there's a ton of research in systems thinking, and but I, I but I can't. Um, I I one of the things that our lab has really taken on is to try to increase the empiricism or the the the, the research sort of validity of um, of the field of systems thinking. There are a lot of different systems thinking methods out there, a lot of different frameworks like system dynamics and uh, soft systems methodology and you know, critical systems thinking and blah, blah, blah. We could go on and on and on. But if you actually dive into those, um, they often are a lot of papers, a lot of opinions, a lot of uh, perspectives, a lot of words, you know, a lot of people's opinions, basically, um, but not really a lot of empirical studies and not really a lot of data. Um, and so we you know, we think that that needs to change in systems thinking. We think systems thinking is so important that we should have, um, you know, greater empiricism, which just means, you know, more empirically designed studies. And and uh, and that's what we've been trying to work on. Yeah, and we've been trying to move towards not only more research, but more accessible research. You know, that's why we talk about that, you know, that we're moving to the fourth wave, which is sort of acknowledging the value of all of those methods that have existed prior to now because they are all valid in specific contexts, but trying to look underneath those methods to some of the universals and usher in this and there, more accessible. And there's really two reasons for that that we're so committed for that. I mean one is one is the 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 public pays for science, right? So if we don't include the public in our, in research, then, then they're not really going to feel like funding it. Um, and, and that's been a mistake that science has made, generally speaking. And two, systems thinking is a bridge field, right? I mean, it's, it's theory and practice, and it's something that everybody in the world needs to do more of. Um, you could probably make the argument, for example, that not everybody has to do quantum mechanics. Um, and, and so, but but everybody needs to be able to do systems thinking. So if the research isn't sort of done and then made clear, then that um, that doesn't really make much sense. Now on the quantum mechanics stuff, I, I you know the public still pays for that research, so so we should be have an ethic of of making that research accessible and available and stuff like that. Excellent. Yeah. Interesting. So uh, that's a good segue. And well, before I ask uh, the next question, um, if anybody has questions you'd like uh, Derek and Laura to answer, please drop them in the chat. We'll, we'll continue on here, but uh, glad to take a detour or two if you, uh, if you have any specific questions, either about the research or, or more generally. Um, so, I, I, so in terms of accessibility, I think everybody on the call are practitioners in some way trying to apply these ideas to uh, make ourselves and our world a better place. And so how, what are the, the steps or the ways that we can go from, you know, the results of this study, there's a short treatment, you know, there's a fish tank, unless we're doing fish tank research, you know, we'll have to take a, a little bit of a leap uh, somehow. Um, how, do we, how do we take this research and make it useful? What are the messages and how can we apply it in our own, in our own work? Well, the first thing is to, to really embrace the concept that it's about everyday thinking everyday problems. It's not, a lot of people think of systems thinking as this big academic field that's only meant for the most intractable, complicated problems that exist on the planet. So, you know, literally start start thinking about anything you're thinking about in this way and, and challenge yourself to solve everyday kinds of things. Like how do you feed 400 pound dogs at the same time in a systematic <laughs> way that doesn't create havoc or- It's an actual problem. It's an actual, true story yeah. you know versus you know how do you look at 
you know, um, cybersecurity in another country and deal with the threats of, you know, that are existing there or the big problems that our military are facing that we work with. So I think it's about, um, what's the word? It's not demystifying. It's like not making it so, feel so intangible and so big, you know, bringing it really down to practicality, which is why it's named Systems Thinking Daily, yeah. right? Yeah, we sometimes say, you know, wicked problems and everyday problems, because a lot of people have the, the the idea that systems thinking is for wicked problems like, you know, climate change or, you know, some global thing that all of us have to focus on uh, or mass shootings or, you know, all those kinds of really wicked problems. But it's also for everyday problems. It's for problems in your family, problems in your organization, problems in your relationships, all, all those kinds of things. In this particular study, I think there's three, really three things that you could take away from this study. Um, one is we can teach systems thinking really easily. Yeah. The other is systems thinking can be learned really easily. Yeah. And then the third is that when a person uses it, it's effective. That we can take those three things away from this study. It increases their cognitive complexity. Um, what I think this implies, which is pretty interesting to me at least, is that systems thinking, the actual skills of systems thinking, the DSRP skills, understanding it, you know, the four skills and, and the elements of those skills is it drop dead easy. I mean, people literally learned it in less than four minutes. Um, but here's the part that's kind of interesting. If you then went into the wild and you, and you gave people a one minute prompt and you went into the wild, I suspect that you wouldn't see sustained cognitive complexity. And the question that I would ask is why? And I think the answer is because these people were primed and when you go into the wild with your regular everyday problems, you're going to resort to your default thinking. You're not going to have DSRP on the brain. You're not going to have it at the forefront of your mind like these people were in the research primed. And so that brings into, um, into importance, the, or it, it, it highlights the importance of, of repetition, right? In other words, you can learn. DSRP in it lickety split very quickly, but lickety split. repetition <laughs> so that you change the default in the yeah. wild so that it is metacognitive. That's the thing that I think um, spawns things like ST Daily and and our new sort of focus and interest on on repetition. Um, so, well, and I think just to add one thing is that it's that repetition that um, moves you from sort of consciously trying to think systemically and get used to it to it becoming just second nature. And then your brain, then you're just sort of, it's all integrated and you're not always thinking about it. And mm -hmm. I, I remember that moment for myself, which okay. was a while ago, but I still remember it where I sort of stopped having to remind myself to think about how I was thinking. And I was just thinking that way mm -hmm. and, and I had better outcomes. Yeah. It's an interesting concept to potentially, you know, before every budget meeting at your organization to do a, a 30 second primer on distinctions or, you know, or something like that, you know, whether that would be to, to bring it into a business context, whether that sort of short treatment would be um, change the discussions. It's an interesting uh, follow up study, maybe. Um, I mean, this this research says it would, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yeah. but that's I think that's a good takeaway. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we got some great questions coming in, uh, and I'll do my best to sort of manage. One was just more generally on the demographics of the study. I believe you said it's uh, sort of U.S.-based, but can you talk a little bit more about the demographics? Yeah. So this study, you know, we always have limited resources because we're <laughs> academics and all of that. So this was a U.S. population between the age of 18 and 85. And um, we did run all of the results according to the demographics and looked at those kinds of things. And what's interesting to us, because we weren't really sure how it would turn out, you know, if there would be differences across groups, and there was actually no statistically significant difference in, in the pre and post for any of the patterns based on ethnicity or education. So just take a minute to think about that. 
So you might have expected to find some difference based on ethnicity and education because of what we know to exist are the inequities that already exist in our systems based on those, um, those demographics. But what that really means, which is, is kind of cool if you think about it, is that, what was the word you used? Egalitarian. egalitarian. The yeah. DSRP is egalitarian. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Meaning, you know, we all equally have this capability and if we develop it, it can be as useful um, across groups, which is yeah. really nice. And then, um, what else did we do with demographics? There weren't- There weren't any significant. statistically significant uh, demographics. Uh, I think the only thing we found was that um, high school, age. people with high school age, uh, no, uh, people with only high school uh, completed uh, for reasons that we don't know or understand uh, did slightly not as well uh, on S, on okay. systems part whole. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't ha have a uh, we don't have a, an explanation for that. But that was statistically significant. But across all gender, uh, race, uh, education level, age, all that stuff, nothing uh, was statistically significant. Which is what we would hope, actually. Uh, you know, because we're you know when you're talking about something like DSRP, which the, the claim being that it's universal, you would you would expect uh, that. Mm -hmm. Right, yep. Could you, uh, one question came in and kind of tease apart, in one, in one hand you're saying it's universal, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that people without the treatment aren't doing it very well, right? So could you sort of tease apart like the universality versus being good at it, I guess, for lack of a better yeah. term? That's a great, that's actually a fantastic question. If you, question. if you think about DSRP, not at the four pattern level, but at the eight element level, and you draw out the elements. So just think of eight things. We are constantly, our brain is constantly using all eight of those elements, but we are aware of almost none of it. Right. So what this study is testing is not the existential nature of DSRP that that's tested in other studies that we'll talk about in, in later uh, in the series, but um, which also show that that it exists. What this study is testing is when you're aware of those elements, then there's a then there's a difference. So it really is it's a study of metacognition of systems thinking, um, and and so that awareness is what is being tested the, the not not the existence of it but the awareness of it that when we study the existence of DSRP we have to do really interesting things because we can't let them know that we're studying what we're studying mm -hmm. uh, whereas this one is pretty straightforward study we're just saying like hey we want you to become aware of this these two pattern this pattern and then and then do something and let's see if that awareness has an effect. Yeah. So you're sort of scraping away the dust on the their capability that's already there. In a, that's in a right. Way. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Interesting. Um, one related question came in that I think is really interesting about whether there's ever a negative effect of training in terms of, and I see this a lot in classes, sort of anxiety of too much detail, right? People often, especially when they're mapping, they're like, uh, now that I understand you know, everything's related. I just end up with half a million arrows and I don't know what to, what to do with them. Um, have you seen that or how do you, how do you sort of think about that, um, that challenge, I guess, and whether you ever see that in, in the research? We, we do have those moments where people say their heads are starting to hurt and they're feeling overwhelmed and those <laughs> kinds of things. But, you know, I would say um, one of the things that we, we do when we're teaching is we, we not only are developing that awareness of these four things, but also getting people to slow down in their language, in their thinking, in their mapping, and take the time at the front end to really apply systems thinking to whatever it is that they're thinking about. And the truth is, once they get accustomed to seeing those underlying structures of the things they're thinking about, that anxiety starts to dissipate it starts to disappear not just the anxiety but the actual occurrence of what you're talking about right. uh, what 
we this is kind of a somewhat technical term we call fropping which yeah. is a comp two words combined into one framing and stopping and it's actually using dsrp to be more clear about why you're what you're bound what what you're trying to understand uh and why and the reason that people end up with too much is usually because they haven't defined what they're trying to uh, what they're attempting to do exactly um, and so as a result you know the universe has a way of just expanding and expanding uh both uh well, that's kind of a no pun intended, literally. But um, the uh, you know the, you're you start seeing all these relationships and part whole systems and all that. But if you limit with your fropping, framing, and stopping rules, then um, then that really isn't a problem. It's actually uh, um, quite easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and if anybody online has not seen those, you can search on the uh, CRL website and there it's one of the most useful sort of lists of uh, concepts to think about as you, especially drawing maps, but but just in general, it's super valuable set of questions. So, yeah, uh, it's, and it's fun to say. Um, <laughs> one question that's kind of interesting to think about is, would you expect other cultures or parts of the world, mm -hmm. I think, you know, potentially indigenous people or something like that who are you know, arguably may think more about sort of systems and how things fit together. You know, is that is that something you think about? Is that something yeah. you expect or not expect? It's something that we think about. We have um, spent some time looking at the research on Eastern and Western styles of thought. And, and in, a, in a lot of ways, this is sort of um, comes from our understanding of that research. I do think it's an area of further interest for yeah. us where we want to start running sort of comparative studies across cultures and, and different types of things because my expectation, and I'm sure it will be fulfilled, is that these things, based on some of the other work we've done looking across, you know, anthropological studies, is that these things are going to be universal and they're, cut out of, they're underneath culture. Um, we have one actually, uh, it's sort of a student of ours from, um, out in uh, Arizona, who's actually starting to do a study where he's using actually the STMI mm -hmm. to see if there are any real noticeable or statistically significant differences between uh, a U.S. population and a population uh, in Singapore of similar demographics of organizational leaders. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of stuff that we want to move into, and people seem to be picking up on your question, Matt, which is, hey, shouldn't we start thinking about looking at this across uh, geography and culture and those kinds of things so yeah. we're doing it just, you know. yeah it'd be, it'd be fascinating it will be and we'll definitely share that when that's done it's going to be a little bit of time and especially as you say uh, you know in a way school systems sort of drive systems thinking out of people and you know whether countries with different styles of education or, or school systems or more apprentice type things or you know others um, would would retain more of their natural systems awareness and there are some there are some existing studies, anthropological studies on uh, uh, uncontacted, quote unquote, uncontacted tribes. Obviously, they've been literally contacted, but, mm -hmm. you know, they don't have a lot of contact mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. around the world. And and we do see DSRP universals in their mm -hmm. um, in their thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, let me just look at a couple questions here. Um, there's a there's a few questions about the the paper and the results. And um, I believe Alina sent out the paper or posted it in uh, Systems Thinking Daily, so you can grab that and see all the details there. Yeah. Um, there was a great question, and you addressed it a little bit, I think, uh, Derek, about how to make it, um, you know, these ways of thinking more behavioral. And you know, one is repetition. Um, I'm wondering, you know, specific to that question, if there's more you would you would add to that, or um, and you know, second to that is this again. This was a one minute treatment, you know, for a very specific topic. You know, what might I do at my work, or you know, with the people I work with, to sort of train them better to again get these behaviors into their work as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... All, uh, along those lines, all of our all of our research papers are available for free online, so you can always get them. But Alina will send the link to this particular one. Um, uh, your first question is kind of that behavioral one, and that, I, I think that's that's really going to be the 
direction of our future research uh, in this area is, is uh, I will tell you that 20 years ago, I would not have said, I would not have said this. And in fact, we started S S systems thinking daily uh, because of this. But what we've seen over and over again for 20 years, anecdotally and, you know, kind of qualitative research and things like that is, um, is that really it's like reps in streets, right? It's like, you know, working out or, you know, eating habits or workout habits or any of those kinds of habitual things. Um, if you don't have repetition, you're not, it's not going to become a habit of mind and you're not going to get the benefits that this study is demonstrating are possible. Uh, it, I think it's fascinating that, that, it, that systems thinking is not hard, right? When I, when I came into systems thinking, the answer to how do I learn systems thinking was you, you spend 20 years studying it. And I just thought that was a ridiculous answer, uh, you know, for something that everybody needs to to know and understand. Mm -hmm. What this study is saying is, you can learn it in four minutes, and mm -hmm. you can you can learn DSRP in four minutes. But that's not the hard part. Understanding systems thinking isn't the hard part. Changing your habits of mind is the hard part. And mm -hmm. that, and I think that is a you know, like I said, I wouldn't have said that twenty years ago. I wouldn't have known that and, and been clear on that, but we are crystal clear on that today, that mm -hmm. learning systems thinking is easy. And in fact, we almost make it harder than it is, uh, but practicing it, and I've said this for a long time, the folks in our trainings who do the best in systems thinking are, you know, usually our trainings are for organizations or, or you know, d d professional right? But the ones that come back and say, you know, I, I was talking to my wife last night, or I was talking to my kids last night, or I was in the shower, or I was on the way to work, or I was noticing this little doohinky, uh, uh, you know, when I was fixing some broken thing. And, and they're making it personal, and they're paying attention to like, the things around them and the conversations, and it becomes personal. Those are the people that do the best because they're applying it in lots and lots of places in, in, in little tiny ways. I think if you try to attack a wicked problem like climate change with, a new, with something that's new and unfamiliar to you that you haven't practiced, it just gets kind of confusing. But if you attack something like how do you feed the dogs or how do you have a conversation with your wife or your husband or you know that kind of thing, um, we just see that people do better with that. And, and that really is, like I said, that's why we started ST Daily, because we saw that people need community and repetition. And we see this across all kinds of different habit formings, uh, you know, whether it's all the different things that we're trying to change habits on. So I, I, it's not surprising, um, but it flies in the face of the conventional wisdom of the field which is that systems thinking really takes a long time to learn yeah. and there's a lot to learn and there really isn't. Well, or that systems thinking is just a method, a, a variety of Yeah, methods, a variety of methods. Something that's universal. And you don't need to buy expensive software. No. Yep, no, no software, no books, no there's nothing. No software is in here. I mean, one of the most popular methods or frameworks in the field, critical systems thinking, just had an anthology of its 40 year history. And it cited, um, I think it's cited in, in, in the entire 40 year history, it's, it's cited three qualitative case studies. So yeah. you're like, okay, well, so that like this whole thing that we based systems thinking on for the last 40 years, which is in order to become a systems thinker, you have to learn all these different frameworks. There's no empirical evidence for that. There's not even empirical studies for it. Never mind evidence. There's just nothing. That's just somebody's opinion. Yeah. Okay. So we're running down. Thank you. We're, <laughs> we're running down on time. There's one last question that came up a couple different ways I want to ask, and then uh, and then we'll wrap up to be uh, sensitive to everybody's time. Um, so it's about uh, control groups and experimenting with the treatment prior to people seeing the image. Uh, of the fish tank and, you know, kind of those ideas, like how, how do you think about that? Um, 
you know, other ways that you could have described, like, uh, you know, you're a marine biologist, what do you see in the fish tank, you know, ways to, to sort of think about it and control the results. Um, so thoughts on that, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, it's a question everybody asks about control groups. So um, <clears throat> there are a couple of things, you know, when we think about um, particular study, uh, at the time that we were designing the study, we were really just trying to do a sort of an exploratory hypothesis test of, you know, if somebody just learned one very quickly, what would the effect be? Would there be an effect? We weren't sure there would be. Um, we, we presume there would. And if so, would it be statistically significant? So we did that part. And now if you think about it, it after the fact, if, if, we had, if we had somebody if we had a control group, meaning if we had um, another group of people look at it once, describe it, and then look at the fish tank again without knowing one of the patterns and describing it again, what, what I would imagine what would happen is they may have more words, they may have more description of that image in the second time because of the familiarity with the image itself and they've had a little more time with it. But what I would I would suppose is they probably would not have as many unique words that indicated specifically a new perspective or a new relationship or going down in scale up or down a level in terms of systems or challenging the distinctions by adding adjectives to the fish that they saw before, that kind of thing. Now, I think it's something that we could do in the future. We, mm -hmm. and we will, when we have, you know, the, uh, the It'd be easy to do. I don't. I don't think you'd see very much difference. I think what you would get is just more words. More words, but, but you wouldn't get the other seven. We we the, the in the paper you'll see it's based on eight dimensions, mm -hmm. and uh, you might get results in one of those that could be explained by that. But in the other seven, I I just don't see any reason why you would get. Uh, uh, different results uh, but I'm from that to test but it. it's certainly something that you could test yeah but it costs twice as much to test and so we just said i don't think we're going to get anything terribly uh useful out of spending twice as much on well research. but also i mean you have to remember i mean matt you know this when you're starting a research program at the beginning when you don't know much you sort of just test things very quickly to sort of get a you know you get a your footing and then you start to add more rigorous, you know, more extensive demographics, control it's the groups, ST loop. You know, it's the <laughs> ST loop. It's also the knowledge method ma matching matrix. You know, like you get more, more and more detailed as you go in. But um, mm -hmm. no, I, I do think that we could do that at some point. Yeah. But be a good thing to but we burn still know what we know. We, we know, know what we know, exactly. We know what we know, which is that after one minute, sixteen hundred yeah. people. Statistically significantly highly greater, statistically. highly statistically had greater. Yeah, for those that for those that are not familiar with the sort of research te terminology, we got highly statistically significant results on across all these, and that's not the norm to get that level of results. So, um, that's that. Generally speaking, that's considered pretty high bar. That's good. Uh, it's very good. It's very good. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And one last comment just came in about it'd be great, which I agree to teach all five, you know, all five minutes of uh, training or four minutes of training to a person and see what happens there rather than focusing on each of the ones. So that would be yeah. interesting too. Yeah. So with that, um, I just want to thank you, Derek and Laura. This is wonderful. I know you have uh, plenty to do, especially with classes starting up and whatnot. So it's great that you spend time with us. And uh, I think it, it I mean, even though your research papers are very accessible, it makes it more accessible when you actually uh, have a chance to talk with you about them and, and learn more. So uh, thank you for taking time. Uh, thanks everybody for attending as we work through, you know, we'd love to have uh, any feedback on the, the session. Uh, as you've seen, Alina's posted, there'll be um, a series of uh, research about once a month, we'll, we'll dive into a different topic. Uh, we're also hoping to bring in some uh, potentially grad students and others to do more sort of, uh, shorter snapshots of, of their work. So I'm hoping to make this a regular thing. Uh, we'll also be posting them you know, online and obviously people are in the network from around the world and can't always make it uh, to a session. So uh, we'll be posting them and, and hope you check them out online as well. So with that, um, thanks everybody. And thanks we'll Matt. Thank you. Great Matt. job on this and uh, thanks everybody. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time. All right, take care, have a good day.